Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, those in California, uh, good evening to the rest of the country and good morning to the Philippines. Um, good day, wherever you are. I'm Cecilia Gerland and I'm with Bataan Legacy Historical Society. And I wanna welcome you to our first webinar. Uh, this will be our first webinar. Since 2015, we have been doing uh, live conferences, World War II in the Philippines. But since the pandemic, we haven't attempted to do a live event. So this will be hopefully a, uh, the first of a series of webinars. I have to apologize for the uh, technical glitches. Uh, I am not uh, a technical wizard. So my uh, apologies, but I want to thank all of you for tuning in today. And I want to thank our partner, the Helen and Joe Farkas Center for the Study of Holocaust in Catholic Schools. Now, the Farkas Center has been uh, teaching Holocaust in Catholic schools since 2007. And I want to thank uh, special thanks to the executive director, Adrian Schreck as well as all of its members, thank you for trusting us uh, in partnering in this event. I also want to thank supporters of Bataan Legacy. I know there are some of you uh, in the audience, but this webinar was actually brought to you by the Joseph and Mercedes McMicking Foundation and Ryan Stinson in honor of his uh, grandfather, uh, Captain um, Calvin Chun who was with the 57th uh, Regiment, Combat Regiment. So I've been wanting to do this topic for so long. Actually, we introduced this a uh, few years ago, but just in small bites. Uh, and especially now with what's happening in Ukraine, in Somalia, Yemen, Afghanistan, and what have you, I think this is a very timely uh, topic. And we are privileged today to have a, an international expert on war crimes, Professor Mark Hall. So we, and uh, actually Professor Hall spoke during our last live event at the University of San Francisco in 2019. So he's returning today and uh, Professor Hull, Mark Hull, is a full professor at the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. And he teaches both military and international criminal law and history. And he earned his doctorate from University College Cork in Ireland and Juris Doctorate from the Cumberland School of Law. And prior to teaching at the uh, Command and General Staff College, uh, Dr. Hall worked as a criminal prosecutor and served as a military intelligence officer to the U.S. Now, his books include Irish Secrets, German Espionage in Wartime Ireland, and Masquerade, uh, Treason, Holocaust Denial, and an Irish Imposter published by the University of Oklahoma Press. And he has published on topics ranging from prosecuting war crimes to military intelligence. He's an elected fellow of the Royal Historical Society and Royal Society of Arts. He's currently in the Doctor of Law program at Friedrich Alexander Universitat in Erlangen, Nuremberg, Germany, to study the topic of incitement by image in international criminal law. Now, does that sound familiar? <laughs> so, but I will start my presentation. I need to share my screen. Can I make a quick announcement about yes. um, uh -huh. before we, so um, the way that we're doing Q&A, everyone is, uh, we'll have a few minutes at the end of each speaker's talk to ask questions specific to their talk. Um, and then at the very end, we'll open the floor up to general uh, Q&A. Um, mm -hmm. It might be hard to keep track of lots of different questions in the, 
in the chat. And so our uh, I think our request for now is if you could submit your questions uh, directly to me in a direct message, uh, I'll ask the I'll just ask the speakers um, in order. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, uh, Kara, we do have a an evaluation sheet afterwards, right? Yeah, yeah, Which, we do have a feedback form um, that we'll send out at the very end. At the very end, yes. So, in uh, 1998, Congress passed Public Law 105-246 which was the Nazi War Crimes Disclosure Act. And uh, this was at the behest of Congress, and it was launched as the largest congressionally mandated declassification of war crimes records in history. And then two years later, uh, Public Law 106-567 was passed. That's the declassification of Japanese imperial government uh, documents. And as a result, 8.5 million uh, documents were uh, open to the public. The, the final report was actually published in 2007. Uh, so I just want to show you Nazi war crimes. There were 8 million uh, declassified pages of declassified information compared to Japanese war crimes, which was just 142,000. So why is that? Why is that the case? Well, the U.S. military, unlike in, uh, in Germany, uh, did not have control of most of the Pacific theater records. And then fewer Japanese war criminal records because there was not a continuing hunt for Japanese perpetrators compared to the Nazis. So uh, also uh, the records of other nations' uh, war crimes trials, they are not subject to the Disclosure Act because they were never in the possession of the United States government. An example would be the Nanking trials. And then also in the late 50s and early 60s, we saw the return of records to Japan. And if you can remember, uh, after the war, we started uh, building up Japan because uh, we the Cold War was setting in. So this was the Imperial Japanese headquarters in Tokyo uh, before the surrender. And also, another reason why uh, we don't have uh, too many records from the Japanese uh, from the Japanese is because between August 15, 1945, and the arrival of small advance parties of American troops in Japan on August 28, 1945, Japanese military and civil authorities systematically destroyed military naval and government archives, especially from the period 1942 to 1945. So that is why we do not have as much uh, documents as uh, the Nazis. Uh, also enciphered uh, messages to field commands throughout Pacific and East Asia ordering units uh, to burn incriminating evidence of war crimes. Now, this was the San Francisco Peace Treaty with Japan in 1951. Actually, it was called, uh, it was signed here in San Francisco. That's why it's San Francisco Peace Treaty. And uh, it established uh, peaceful relations between Japan and the Allied forces. And that's why a lot of the documents were sent back to Japan uh, in the late 50s and early 60s. Now, crimes against humanity. Like today, you know, um, during that time, actually, uh, people thought that the, uh, the massacres were because of a few soldiers who ran amok. But the, that was not the case. And the origin of the methodology uh, goes back to 1932. 
So this uh, philosopher and writer, he was a founder of a radical uh, ultra-nationalist uh, organization. He was actually uh, in collaborated with the uh, Kwantung Army. The Kwantung Army was the most radical uh, army, Japanese army, and they were based in Manchukuo. And he advocated for the end of white domination in Asia. And uh, so he worked with the Kwantung Army, and he was behind actually several plots between the 1920s and 1930s. There were several assassination attempts, actually, I think two, two or three Japanese prime ministers and several ministers uh, where there were uh, attempts by these ultra-nationalist groups and about at least two or three uh, prime ministers were actually assassinated. And then, so these two guys, I'm trying to explain the uh, methods of mo methodology that was used, not just in the Philippines, but all throughout Asia, all throughout the occupied countries, the countries that were occupied by the uh, Imperial Japanese Army. So as I said, in the 1920s and 30s, there was a rise of ultra-nationalist group within the army. And um, General Sadao Araki was actually one of those who um, used Dr. Okawa's uh, principle and merged it with the um, Genju Shobun, which is harsh disposal or disposal on the spot. There was no hearing. So, and um, so he expanded on the directive and he also used the principle of Hakuichu, which is bringing together of the corners of the world under one ruler. So basically it was used to justify um, emperor worship the imperial way, which was called Kodo. And its principles lie in denying judicial process. And the method of execution used was called harsh disposal, Genju Shobun, or disposal on the spot. And the Japanese cabinet at a meeting on April 11, 1932, approved the execution of the Manchurian policies. In other words, this was a way of dealing with the insurgents, as they called them. And uh, okay. now, uh, fast forward, 1937. So this evolved or devolved into a methodology called kill all, burn all, loot all. And uh, so Genchi Shobun, or disposal on the spot, uh, there was a massive cleanup, uh, especially after the fall of Nanking, where we saw approximately 200,000 uh, who were massacred. So in 1937, this was used by General Iwane Matsui, who was the commander of the Shanghai Expeditionary Force. This was used in Nanking. And his vice chief of staff was Lieutenant General Akira Mur Muto. And you will see Muto later uh, in the Philippines as the chief of staff for General Yamashita. So I'm just looking at the, uh, to see the dates of the Nuremberg trial and the Tokyo trials because the Tokyo trials took longer. And this was the United States Military Commission in the Philippines. That is the, uh, what now, what nowadays, that's the uh, US Embassy in the Philippines. But at that time, this was the US High Commissioner's residence. And then, so this started in late 1945. It was set up by uh, General uh, Douglas MacArthur. And then later on, it became the Philippine People's Court where Filipino collaborators were tried. 
Now, let's see who was convicted. The most infamous one, of course, was uh, General Tomoyuku, Tomoyuki Yamashita. And he was the commanding officer only from the 8th of October, 1944, to the 3rd of September when he surrendered. And he was executed by hanging on 23 February, 1946. Actually, there were a lot of um, criticisms about the... Uh, his um uh the way it was tried because uh according to some people uh he was uh well he was really up in nor in in northern luzon when the uh, battle of manila was happening but you know this is not a remote or an isolated uh event what happened in uh, the Battle of Manila. The Battle of Manila started February 3 to March 3, 1945. But you can see here that uh, he's, he, um, he was in Manchupo. He was part of the Kwantung Army. He was also implicated in a plot in 1936. And um, he was chief of staff uh, between 1938 and 39, uh, the North China Expeditionary Force. And then he became the uh, 25th Army Commanding Officer in uh, Malaysia. And if you remember, there was the Sukching Massacre, which happened in Singapore from February 21 to March 5. And approximately about 50,000 people were massacred. And then October 9 to 1944 to October 3, he was the commanding officer of the Imperial Japanese Army. Uh, another uh, officer or commanding officer was Lieutenant General Masaharu Homa, who was the commanding officer of the 14th Army from December 22, 1941 to August 1942. And he was the commander during uh, the Battle of Bataan and also during the Bataan Death March. He was executed by firing squad on April 3, 1946, uh, executed as a Class C war criminal. And then this uh, Colonel Akira Nagahama was commander-in-chief of the Kempetai or the uh, Japanese military police in the Philippines from 30 September 1942 to February 1945, and he was executed by hanging 31 March 1947 in Laguna. Now, uh, we saw Akira Muto, who was uh, in China during the rape of Nanking. He was the chief of staff for Yamashita, and uh, he was executed, he was repatriated to Japan uh, and uh, he was executed by hanging in on the 23rd of December, 1948. Uh, okay. Now, there were others who were prosecuted, uh, who were uh, executed, but not all of them uh, uh, were, like, for example, Colonel Masanobu Suji, Soji actually in the interagency uh, working group, which was declassifying the, uh, the documents, he was mentioned several times. And um, wait a minute. And he was actually um, sent there by this guy, Count Hisaishi Terauchi who was actually uh, in charge, he was, uh, he oversaw the 14th Army because he felt that Homa was not uh, tough enough with the soldiers. So that's Colonel uh, Masanobu Suji. And uh, also later on, he uh, actually became a member of the Japanese parliament. So this is the connection. They were all connected, Muto, Yamashita, and uh, Suji, because they were actually in Singapore during the uh, Sokching massacre. Now, Rear Admiral Sanji Iwabuchi, people uh, often uh, blamed him for the massacres uh, during the Battle of Manila. Uh, he was never prosecuted because he committed suicide 
rather than be uh, taken alive. But as we know, it was not isolated uh, incidents. Uh, they were actually a policy by the Imperial Japanese Army, which existed starting in 1932. As I said, this is Count Hisaishi uh, Terauchi. He was not prosecuted because he died while in custody uh, on June 12, 1946. And then uh, Manuel Rojas, who was president of the Republic of the P Philippines, uh, granted amnesty to the Filipinos who were prosecuted. And I will uh, defer to uh, Professor Hull later. He, he will talk about the, uh, the amnesties. And then in 1953, uh, then President of the Republic of the Philippines, uh, El Pidio Quirino, uh, granted amnesty to uh, the Japanese uh, um, war criminals. And as long as they, they had to go back to Japan and promise not to return to the Philippines. So he granted executive clemency to about 114 Japanese war prisoners. Of these, 31 were sentenced to life imprisonment and 27 to various terms. 58 were pardoned in one document on the condition that they leave the Philippines. Uh, by the way, President Quirino lost his wife and two children during the uh, Battle of Manila. Uh, but he wanted to do this uh, as a way of uh, getting the country back on its track, but also at that same time, reparations with Japan or reparations from Japan were being discussed. So it's probably. Uh, a combination of both reasons. So that concludes my um, presentation. As I said, war crimes happened all over uh, Japanese occupied uh, countries in Asia. And in the Philippines, of course, we have the Bataan Death March, uh, where between five to 10,000 uh, Filipinos and between 250 to 650 Americans died during the march. Most of them were already suffering from massive disease, starvation. Uh, so during the march, they, uh, they had to uh, walk or they were forced to walk some 65 miles away. And those who could not go on were either beaten, bayoneted, shot, some were even beheaded. And there's a slew of uh, war crimes that happened, uh, especially to civilians. Uh, like in uh, after the uh, rescue of the uh, Allied civilian prisoners of war in uh, Manila and in Los Baños, the Japanese retaliated by massacring the uh, civilians. There were also, it was actually massacred throughout the country, uh, but in between uh, the massacres, the shelling, approximately 1 million Filipino civilians died. And um, so, um, so that's why we need to, to get this uh, taught in schools. Uh, we actually were able, Bataan Legacy was able to get uh, to work successfully with the California Department of Education between 2014 and 2016 to include World War II in the Philippines in the grade 11 U.S. history. So that is now being implemented, but it's up to the teacher or it's up to the school itself to get it implemented. It is only part of chapter 16, which talks about World War II. So we have a sample uh, lesson plans that uh, grade 11 uh, US history teachers from the Bay Area created. They are available through our website, batanlegacy.org other lesson plans, and you can uh, see the lesson plans and they can be uh, downloaded 
and can be used. And we only use actually primary documents, primary documents, no, um, you know, no secondhand information. We only use primary documents. So that concludes my presentation. Uh, do we have any Great. questions? Thank you so much, um, Cecilia. We did have a few questions come in, so we're going to spend uh, five or 10 minutes taking questions um, specifically for Cecilia before we move on to um, Professor Hull's talk. Um, so one of the questions that came in was, let's see, what was the reason for the mass executions? 200,000 in Nanking, 50,000 in Singapore. Weren't people more valuable as laborers or workers in war industries? It was a way of suppressing uh, the people, like what you're seeing now in uh, in Ukraine. It was a way of suppression, and it's still happening now. Not just in Ukraine, you see it in uh, Somalia, in Yemen, in uh, in Afghanistan. It's still happening today. That's why we need to learn the lessons of history. Otherwise, it will keep on uh, repeating itself. Great. Um, and the next question uh, we received was, with the recent assassination of Sincho um, Abe, um, there's been discussion about the rise of nationalism in Japan. To what extent are there parallels to the nationalism during World War II that eventually led to the war crimes we are learning about today? Actually, uh, these uh, it, it's, it's so similar. Uh, and uh, as you know, even um, even Hirohito, uh, there was an attempted uh, assassination uh, in the early 30s. So there is a rise, as we see it all over uh, the world, uh, in Europe, in uh, in Asia, in in Africa, in uh, everywhere. Uh, Everywhere in the world, there's a rise of nationalism, and we have to be very vigilant. So, uh, and and we see it in the United States. <laughs> so we have to be very vigilant as to um, you know, so that our freedom we cannot we cannot we cannot we can never uh, take for granted the freedom that we have today. Uh, so uh, as we see uh, what's happening in. Uh, all over the United States, where misinformation and partisanship, uh, there's no uh, civil discourse anymore. And, and we have to go back to that. Okay, thank you. Uh, there was one question that got posted in the general chat um, that asks, uh, what happened to those Japanese army responsible for Huntington massacre? Uh, well, you know, some were uh, actually executed, but there were some uh, because of the amnesty. Uh, some were actually, uh, they were able to let go of a lot of these people, especially um, not, uh, you know, the uh, Akira, not, not Akira Muto, but... Um, some of them were, because of the amnesty, were able to be pardoned. So uh, it's it's so sad because uh, they never um, showed, uh, they, they were never uh, able to, we were not not able to, uh, they were not uh, given the, uh, what was, uh, they should have paid for what they did. That's, that's, uh, that's what I'm saying. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I think those are mostly the questions that came up. Um, someone asked if there was a book detailing all the massacres in World, World War II in the Philippines. Um, someone else responded. If anyone else has any responses to that, please feel free to post them in the chat. Um, but now I think we are gonna turn to our second speaker, uh, Professor Mark Hall. And um, so I'm gonna spotlight Professor Hall. And uh, again, um, if folks have specific questions for, for Professor Hull, um, please submit them directly to me uh, via direct message in the chat. Okay. Ready? 
Okay, uh, first of all, welcome everybody and thank you for participating. Uh, I'm very grateful to Cecilia and Kara both for, for letting me uh, spend some time with you. Uh, we're going to sort of do a flying look at a couple of different issues and I, I want to maybe try to explain what you should expect from what's happening today, this morning, and over the last six months in the Ukraine. But we're going to drop back and, 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 and touch on a few things, uh, historical things, from the Second World War. So the idea that the past is, is the past, it's forgotten, it's gone. Uh, it should not be the way that you think about this. Um, there's a thing that happens in then and now. And I'm going to tell you a short story to begin. So we're going to go back to Europe for a second. And in September 1939, both the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany invaded Poland. Uh, what happened in the Russian zone of occupation, it basically they cut Poland in half and Russia got the eastern half and, and the, the Germans got the western half is that the Soviet, Soviets uh, took all of the captured uh, Polish officers, about 25,000 of them, and put them in three separate camps. They could receive and send mail, uh, so their families at least knew that they had survived. But what happened starting in April 1940, so roughly seven months after they were captured, is that the letter stopped coming. And Polish officials at the Polish government in exile in London were asking the Soviets, uh, where are our people? And families were asking. And the Russians just simply stopped responding. That mystery went on. And it continued even after, of course, after the German invasion of the Soviet Union, when Russia became an ally to, 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 to the United States and Great Britain and France. Um, but in 1943, what happened is the German army basically stumbled on the graves of 5,000 Polish officers at a place called Katyn. Uh, it's just west of the city of Smolensk. And... The Germans were quick to publicize the fact and essentially say, hey, look, this isn't one of ours. Okay, we didn't do this. So they brought in forensic teams and more labor. Uh, German army units were detailed to unearth the bodies. They brought in forensic experts. They brought in international observers. And they tried to identify as many of the bodies as they could. Uh, the Germans only had about five months to work with the, the project until the Soviet Union occupied the territory again. So the Germans reburied the bodies. Um, as it turned out, the, this Katyn is one of three execution sites. Uh, the total killed for the three sites is exactly 21,768 Polish officers. Some priests, um, some there's, there's an admiral who's killed, but officers from lieutenant all the way up to, to full general. So when the Soviets came back to the area, they opened the graves again and made a show of bringing in Soviet experts to prove that no, no, no. In fact, it was the Germans who murdered the prisoners. And nobody bought it. Uh, the the especially Churchill, but uh, Roosevelt didn't really either. But the problem was that while the war continued, you needed the Soviet Union as an ally. So nothing happens at all between the end of the German occupation of Katyn and the end of the war. And because the Soviets felt that the world didn't believe their 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 story, which was in fact a lie. Uh, the Soviets insisted on bringing, wanting to bring charges against the Germans at the Nuremberg trials, claiming that the Nazis had, had murdered Polish officers. The court didn't believe them either. And in fact, the court made no finding whatsoever uh, in the verdict in October 1946. And there things just sat for many, many, many years, essentially 50 years. And the 
Part of the problem with Katine, I think, is generally true of war crimes as a whole, which is the expectation that you're going to get some clear resolution in a timely fashion in a court of law is probably unrealistic for a variety of reasons. So in the case of the Katyn massacre, all of the victims are dead. They, they have all been killed. There are no surviving Polish witnesses. The Russians, the secret police, the NKVD who murdered them are not talking and probably would not want to. So there's no forum whereby you can try to hold the Russians responsible for the, for the murders that they committed. Again, they, they murdered 21,758 Polish officers. That's part of the problem with thinking of courts as ways to get at justice when it comes to war crimes. And there are many reasons why the courts, why you can't get justice with an international forum or a national forum, maybe. And then there are reasons why you might not want to. And that'll bring us back to the Philippines here in a few minutes. Well, OK, how about now? <clears throat> so. In the case of atrocities committed in the Far East, there are, they're beyond counting. Uh, nobody's ever gonna give an accurate total of, of, of the millions of people murdered you know, by the Japanese occupation forces in China, in the Philippines, in Malaya, in, in every place the Imperial Japanese Army went to. So whether we're talking about the Manila Massacre or Palawan or the Bataan Death March, there are a number of reasons why those things aren't really going to be adjudicated in, in, in a complete or systematic way. And the first problem is, and we see this in both just ordinary criminal trials not having anything to do with war crimes, which is in most cases, the victims cannot identify by name the persons who hurt them. Neither can witnesses. And even in cases like Manila, for example, all right, there, there are a couple of, of high-level prosecutions. You know, uh, uh, Cecilia uh, very uh, correctly talked about uh, Yamashita and Homa for the Bataan Death March and uh, General Mudo, who is the uh, chief of staff of the 14th Army. The lower people down the line who actually did the killing are almost guaranteed never to be prosecuted because in most cases, we have absolutely no idea who they are. Their victims never knew their names. And Japanese records that either were, were destroyed or first of all, never kept in the first place because unlike the Germans who are just you know, obsessively devoted to, to keeping records, that wasn't generally true of the Imperial Japanese Army or the Special Naval Landing Force. And the other issue that occurs in the Philippines, and it also is going to come back to us when we get to Ukraine, which is sort of the focus of where I want to, I want to be this evening, that there are reasons why you may, might not want to prosecute people for the offenses they committed. So <clears throat> in the case in the Philippines, uh, the Makapili, you have a networks of informers, in some cases, groups that political groups that are actively organized to help the Japanese occupation forces. After the war is concluded, the question then becomes, first of all, do, do you have Japanese in custody and can you identify them and tie them to a specific incident? And the second case involves the idea that for domestic reasons, you might not want to prosecute people at all. So the Makapili or Kalibapi, the, the idea is that it might be better for sort of truth and reconciliation, if you like, inside the country after the war to simply not do anything. There are a couple of sort of, you know, uh, slow moving, not successful attempts to prosecute a handful of people, but the decision is made just to let the rest of them go. And that's the decision, of course, the countries have to make. You know, we saw the, the same thing, too, with, with uh, apartheid after, in South Africa. Uh, after the Rwandan genocide, the decision was made in many cases to simply let killers go because the point was to get the country reunified and back together. That's a problem. And it's a problem, especially if, if you're looking for sort of objective justice. Did person A answer for the crimes that they committed? 
And in most of the cases, the answer is going to be simply no. So after World War II, there are 5,700 prosecutions in, in, the, in the Pacific theater. Prosecutions by Australia, the United States, the Philippines, Great Britain, uh, every country involved, but 5,700 cases and only a handful, of, well, that's not really true, but a third of them resulted in, in conviction. A lot of them didn't. A lot of them had insufficient evidence. But if you were able to wait it out, and after that first sort of limited time where you stood a decent chance of being executed if you're convicted, you're probably going to receive amnesty or just simply be released. And the problem is that after World War II, we, we don't really get the same sort of unity that we had from 1941 through 1945. And despite, you know, uh, scholars will publish papers and different leaders will come forward and say, well, you know, we need to do something about international criminal law and holding people accountable for the three big counts at Nuremberg. So crimes against peace, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. And it just never gels until the late 1990s. Uh, so in 1998, uh, enough countries passed what is called the Statute of Rome, which establishes the International Criminal Court. Uh, the court becomes operational in 2002. But if the expectation is that we finally have an international forum where people are going to be responsible for the things that they have done, uh, go 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 light on the gas on that because it it it's just not going to be the case most of the time. So countries that have have agreed to or sign excuse me signed and ratified the ICC the International Criminal uh, Court Statute of Rome, uh, the U.S. had signed it at one point uh, under President Clinton. But when President Bush came in, he, he, he made a proclamation of unsigning it. So the United States is not part of the International Criminal Court. Now, the thing is, if something happens, and let's we're going to go to Ukraine that we've seen over the last six months, keep that in mind. But keep in mind also things like Rwanda and former Yugoslavia or Sierra Leone, or any of the other places where large scale you know, mass atrocities have taken place. There are a couple of different things that are, are conceivably possible. Uh, in the army, we use a phrase uh, fairly often, it's called the self-licking ice cream cone, which means an organization that is really designed to sort of perpetuate itself, but it doesn't necessarily really do anything. Uh, one of the things that you could do if you have a case where country A does something terrible to the citizens of country B is you could go to the International Court of Justice, which is in The Hague. The problem is the International Court of Justice is only applicable, first of all, to states, not to individual persons. So you could not try somebody at the ICJ. What you can do is if both parties agree and only if both, both parties agree, you can get a ruling from the ICJ, which is not really binding. It's Think of it like a court of arbitration. But in the case of the International Criminal Court, as I said, which has been active since 2002, uh, there have been about 30 cases, uh, average time from starting an investigation at the ICC to uh, a verdict surviving appeal, a uh, guilty verdict, is about 10 years. Now, at Nuremberg, we have 22 convictions in a year. Uh, the Japanese war crimes trials take longer for a variety of different reasons. I mean, there, there are a lot of sort of people, you know, uh, cooks uh, in the broth on that one. Um, but ICC jurisdiction applies only if you have signed and ratified the, the, the statute of Rome. Or in the case of Ukraine, you have agreed to the jurisdiction of the court. So the ICC could have primary jurisdiction over what happens in Ukraine, but Russia is not a signatory to the ICC. So jurisdiction is an issue with any kind of international criminal tribunal, no matter how terrible or how you know widespread a mass atrocity might be. The second thing, and this goes back both to the Philippines as well as to the Katyn massacre, if you don't have people in custody, it doesn't really make any difference. 
So first of all, you have to win and you have to have physical control over the individuals that you're accusing of committing a crime. Uh, the other issue too is can you, should you, do you want to go from maybe person at a lower level who's actually doing the killing and, and walking the chain back up to somebody that is in overall or you know mid-level command. Now the case of Yamashita, you know, we, we could talk about that maybe some somewhere separately. But the idea of command responsibility is that to get a conviction for this, you have to prove that somebody either knew, gave an order, they knew or should have known that something was occurring, and they had a power to do something about it. Um, the ICC, for example, does not try people in absentia. So again, you have to have physical custody. Uh, one of the Nuremberg defendants, uh, Mark Martin Bormann, was tried in absentia, but it turned out uh, he was convict convicted, sentenced to death. Uh, it, but as it turned out, we they discovered his body in the 1960s, and he'd been dead since 1945. Evidentiary issues are, are kind of a big deal. So as of this morning, I checked, and there are about 300 separate investigations that are going on inside Ukraine at different sites. But chain of evidence is a big deal, and especially if you want to try to walk this back to different levels of, of, of order givers between the killing and the person who either ordered it, knew about it, looked the other way. You have to show that there there is this this evidentiary chain that that you can prove you know beyond a reasonable doubt. And one of the the issues here too is that especially in as concerns the International Criminal Court and the Ukraine situation specifically is that one of the charges that you're not you cannot bring in this case because that both parties aren't signatories is you can't bring a charge of crimes against peace. So what we've seen over the last six months is is almost manifestly criminal activity by Russian forces attacking, you know, murdering civilians, attacking hospitals, attacking infrastructure, uh, airstrikes, uh, artillery strikes, uh, missile strikes that, that almost have to be done for the purpose of killing, hurting, or scaring civilians. Uh, the charge at the ICC, if you can bring them, would be really war crimes or crimes against humanity. Um, another way that you could go, though, if you if you don't want to go to the International Criminal Court, is the United Nations could th theoretically set up a special tribunal. And we did this with Rwanda and Yugoslavia and Sierra Leone. So it's outside the ICC. The problem is, if you do it under the UN banner, uh, it can be just vetoed and blocked by the Security Council. And Russia is a permanent standing member of the Security Council. The other alternative for looking at cases that we're seeing, again, right in front of us in real time, is the cases could be brought, and several, some of them have been brought, in U Ukrainian national courts against Russians that they happen to have taken in, 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 in prisoners in combat. It's not, we haven't really seen a lot of quality stuff go on so far, but I would anticipate that this, is, this may change. Uh, we have some advantages that were not present in 1945 and 1946 or 1947 is that if you can get access to them, you have intercepts of cell phones and satellite communications uh, and some other stuff we're, we're not going to talk about tonight. Uh, if you can get those entered into evidence, you could conceivably walk the thing back up and get somebody in a court, provided you could get physical custody. And since it's unlikely that Russia is going to agree to provide people, especially the, the president of, of, the, of the Russian Federation, Vladimir Putin, for trial, uh, you may be stuck with private so-and-so or sergeant so-and-so, assuming you can get a witness or some other kind of evidence that shows that they actually did the thing that they probably did. Buka is a case that has attracted a lot of attention and for good reason. Uh, there are 
30 plus civilians that seemingly were just sort of shot out of hand. Uh, these these attacks were certainly committed by by forces of the Russian Federation. Uh, the total, I don't think we're going to know for a while in terms of like how many just pure civilians were killed by Russian military or paramilitary. But to go back for a second, when you, you start thinking about what Ukraine can do or what the world community can do or the, the international criminal law community can do, uh, think back to the Makapili. So the idea in Ukraine is what about the people in eastern Ukraine? who regard themselves as ethnic Russians, do you want to start filing charges against them for war crimes? And if your interest, your interest is sort of reunification of Ukraine as a nation state and reinforcing that, you may decide to look the other way for collaboration, of which there are tens, if not hundreds of thousands of people that could conceivably be charged with it. So in short, some of the basic questions you need to ask with, with Ukraine and with uh, the Batan death march for that matter, or with the, the, the Holocaust, uh, what charges can you bring and where can you bring them? So again, the jurisdiction thing and the physical custody thing is, is gonna be important. But even if you can bring charges and you don't have the people responsible, and if it's not likely that they are going to be turned over in, 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 in our lifetime, um, what about that? Is it worthwhile bringing charges if you're not actually getting to the people that, that, you know, that are responsible? And if you can't get that, if the people aren't made available, if you don't, uh, is again likely the likely case with Russia? what sort of system, what sort of punishment you, you want to do. And if none of those, if those things are kind of, none of them are true. So you, you, your charges may be, may be iffy. Um, if you can't get defendants, uh, is there a point really of doing this in an international forum where again, you know, start to finish may take a decade. I don't know, but that's a question both for the international community, but more specifically for Ukraine, which which route that they think is going to be most effective. But the most important thing, again, is that to for any of this to happen, they have to win. And I hope that they do. But trying to to think about this through the lens of justice for victims, uh, there, there are a lot of barriers in the way. And it just depends on what you want to do. I mean, do you want to go the legal route or do you don't want to do something else? Um, I don't think this is a good solution, but for example, in 1945, uh, Winston Churchill objected to the idea of the Nuremberg Tribunal, saying that we should just, you know, pick some of the German leaders and just shoot them and move along. But that's not a good answer, and I don't think it's the morally correct answer. So my thing here really at the at the end end of all this is sort of thinking about the issues of justice and criminal law and especially Ukraine. And I have you know students of mine, Ukrainian officers who are fighting for their lives. Um, Martin Luther King one time said that the arc of history bends toward justice. And I don't know that I believe that, but I think that the arc of history probably bends toward truth if you're patient. And it depends, I think, maybe on which you regard as more important. Does is a trial process necessary for 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 what you want for what you want to do, for what's important to you? Those are questions that people in the Philippines ask. Those are questions that people in occupied Poland ask. And I think those are questions that the Ukrainians are, are gonna be asking or have asked. And you know, I, I work with a couple of different organizations and, and we're trying to give them as much help as we can, but it remains to be seen and we'll, we'll all sort of learn together. That would be 
it, I think. Kara, how am I doing on time? Oh, you've got you've got a couple minutes if you if you want them. No, uh, let's, let, 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 let's let's go to uh, uh, Q and A if, if if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you so much, Professor Hall. That was wonderful. Um, I certainly learned a lot. Um, and uh, so I haven't gotten any questions so far. I'm sure people have them though. So if folks have questions, um, for could, could, I ask, could I ask one? Yeah, absolutely. Or we could just open it up to, I mean, yeah, you and I mean, if you two just wanna have a conversation now and maybe folks can um, put questions in the chat for either or both of you at this point. You know, there was a question about the Pantingan River massacre which happened after the uh, fall of Pataan. So this happened on uh, April 12th. Uh, and uh, what happened was between 300 and 350 uh, commissioned and non-commissioned officers were massacred. Uh, and supposedly, uh, it was there was a witness who said that General Akira Nara uh, went to one of the headquarters near uh, uh, Pantingan River, and then as soon as he left, they were rounded up. The Filipino officers uh, were rounded up, and uh, they were all massacred uh, in the Pantingan River. And uh, but you know, uh, General Nara was never uh, prosecuted. And as a matter of fact, I requested. Uh, information from the CIA under the Freedom of Information Act, and uh, it was denied. I don't know why. I mean, 80 years after, it was, it was denied. But he was never prosecuted. Uh, so, yeah. I'd want to know that that alone would make me really the, the fact that they told me I can't see something really just makes me want to see it all the more. Uh, I know. that would, yeah. Well, well, I did ask for information from the archives, national archives, and at that time, I think because of COVID, they weren't taking uh requests, online requests. But I'm going to try again. Uh, but it's just uh, amazing how he. Uh, was able to escape prosecution. Well, Cecilia, if maybe if security at the National Archives isn't that great, we could break in sometime, and I'm, <laughs> I'm down with that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, Mark, let me ask you, uh, what uh, was your incentive in specializing in war crimes? It, it didn't start till pretty late. So I, I've been a lawyer for quite a long time. I've been a lawyer for it'll be 31 years in October mm -hmm. and God, that makes, that makes me ancient. But um, I didn't start with the war crimes thing until after I served in Iraq and I saw mm -hmm. people that were ostensibly on our side that were, were, mm -hmm. were committing, committing war crimes. Yes. And I, I couldn't get anybody to care. I, I, I eventually had people who told me they, I needed to shut up and stop reporting things. So that, that it's sort of like the same thing too, that if you tell me I can't, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to, that's going to bug me. Mm -hmm. And that's really when I, I, I started with it. Um, mm -hmm. And there's so much more I need to know. I mean, there's so, there's just, there's, there's so much, I was, you know, one of the things I, I when I was doing the prep for, for, for the talk tonight, I started looking around at the, scholarship dealing with collaborators in the Philippines and what happened to them. Mm -hmm. So what I, I think I, I, I've learned, but maybe somebody can help me, is there, w there's a lot, I mean, a lot more need, that needs to be done with that. So mm -hmm. in terms of sociology, in terms of history, in terms of law, mm -hmm. but I can understand why it would be sensitive or I can see, I understand why there would be a disincentive for for, for a lot of people not to look at it. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, if you don't mind, let me ask you. So, I mean, you're, you're, you're kind of my, my hero and a force of nature. So what made you start with the, the Bataan Legacy Historical Society? Well, you know, what happened was I wrote this screenplay about um, 
mother-daughter relationship set during World War II. And uh, so what happened was uh, nobody bought it. So I turned it into a book because a reviewer said, oh, um, it would make a good book, right? So, um, uh, so I did. Then I turned it into a play. Then I found out that not too many people had heard about the Bataan Death March. And, you know, here in the United States, most of the perspective are from the American point of view. And then I found out later that seven eighths of the main line of resistance were Filipinos. Uh, majority were Filipinos. It's like 100, uh, 110,000 Philippine Commonwealth, 12,000 Philippine Scouts who were mostly Filipinos with mostly American officers and 19,000 Americans. But the way it's portrayed here is, uh, you know, there were no Philip. So, so I took it, you know, it, my father also was in the Bataan Death March. Fortunately, he survived. But the uh, real stories, you know, I only learned about them when I started meeting uh, veterans. And uh, it, it's, it, it's just uh, heartbreaking uh, knowing about these stories because my father never really uh, revealed the extent of uh, his experience. And as a matter of fact, there was one document from Fort Benning, which was an analysis of his regiment, the 41st Infantry Regiment, and after which was commanded by General Vicente Lim, who was executed, by the way, by the Japanese. And when I read this document, boy, I started crying because I didn't know this had happened. You know, they were left there to hang and dry. And uh, towards the end of the war, uh, you know, soldiers even uh, took their own lives because they were so desperate. And uh, so that's what happened. And uh, so I think it is incumbent upon uh, us, the descendants, and I'm talking about those uh, in the Philippines and uh, here in the United States to ensure that their legacy will be learned uh, here in the United States and the Philippines. And it's unfortunate, let, unfortunate that uh, this is not being taught in high school in, uh, in the Philippines. Uh, uh, for why? political reasons. Okay. <laughs> that's, that, that's disturbing. I mean, that's it really, is very really disturbing. Scary. I mean, how are we, how will the Filipino nation learn about the legacy of uh, their heroes unless they are taught in schools? You, you know, it was funny. I was given a talk to a group a little while ago, and it was, I'm sorry, it was a law school class. And the one person and asked a question said, well, you know, the, the, the Germans have been trying in, in like in public and in school to deny the Holocaust and to to downplay it. And no, they haven't. In fact, if you go and you look at the educational system, we have, we have a young friend who's he just uh, uh, he's not at the university in Germany. They know more about that than American kids have ever will know so in terms of like actually having a class on the holocaust for germans mm -hmm. they mm -hmm. must take it mm -hmm. and in america you're right until like until you, until you start working with, with with like the high school curriculum mm -hmm. there is there's no requirement whatsoever here to, to learn a thing about that that's uh, right you may, you may get it by accident if the teacher if it's one of the things the teacher really thinks is important mm -hmm. But otherwise, you're going to go your whole life and you'll never have heard of it. And the, the idea that it's not even taught in, in Filipino schools is just, I, I, I don't get that at all. I think that's, mm -hmm. that's outrageous. There's, mm. um, there's a question in the chat. Um, I also have one that I'd like to ask uh, Professor Hall. It's, um, what, what are the gaps that you think need to be filled in the scholarship based on your kind of higher level view? That's my question. Um, and the other question is for both of you, and it's how do you maintain hope in your work? It seems like such an uphill battle and a wall of indifference. Uh, Tara, if you don't mind, in terms of gaps, can you, in which, for, in which subfield? Oh, like which, you which said, like, um, you know, that there were gaps in, that could be covered in sociology or history or. Well, okay, so, so I'm going to, 
I'm going to be careful here because I, I, I know like where, where my depth stops and, and, and this is not one of my things. Um, with the, with collaboration generally, and this goes to, to almost any country that's ever had to deal with it. So whether it, I looked at it, things briefly, for example, in Italians that were cooperating with, with, with Nazi Germany or French that cooperated with the, with the Nazis. Um, they're, there does not seem to be a good central standard work that were, where they have done a lot of interviews or looked at a lot of the documentation and, and sort of made a thing of it. Uh, there are bits and pieces that I was able to find. And again, I, I, this is, I, I'm, I'm, I know I'm going to say something stupid. I, I just know I am. But I, I could not find a, a one-stop shop that I thought did that very well with, with the, 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 the Philippines. Mm -hmm. And again, even if, if you, like, for example, there's a French national narrative that they are, that every one of them was a resistor. So when uh, Charles de Gaulle, after the war, he issued the resistance medal and you could apply for the resistance medal. And, and you had to say that you're in this, you know, this group or this group. And, and so I think 3 million people applied for it. And de Gaulle famously said, gee, it would have been nice to actually have these people in the resistance during the war because he didn't see them. I mean, th there were active resistance groups that, that actually did things. And then a lot of people who later claimed to be members of the resistance, but they, they never were. Mm -hmm. But it's a tough national conversation to have because if it's your father or your grandfather or your great grandfather or somebody, I, I do, I fully understand just as a person why you would do like softly, softly around some of those things because it's embarrassing. And the same thing, I mean, it's not like America has has any, you know, you know, we don't need to be like preaching to anybody about this. Because, I mean, I, I remember one time when I was little, I don't know, I was maybe like 10 years old, and I had just read Martin Luther King's letter from Birmingham Jail. And I love it. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's just a great piece of, it's an, a moral piece of writing. And we're sitting around the dinner table and, you know, my parents would ask me like what I was reading or what I learned about. And I said, said this. And I, then I asked them, well, you know, what did you think about segregation? Because they had grown up in this. And they both said that it was just, it was just awful. It was just terrible. And then I said, well, what, what, what did you do about that? Which is pretty much where the dinner conversation stopped. Because it's embarrassing. And it's not, these are, trem, trem, my parents are tremendous people. I mean, just highly moral. And, but I think that was a question they, they really, they, they didn't want to think about or didn't want to answer. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry, I care a sec, second question? Oh, yeah, the second question. I think it's actually a great one to end on. Um, is how do you both maintain hope in the work that you do? Um, it's, it's a, these are heavy subject matters. Um, it's always, it always seems like an uphill battle. Uh, how do you, what, um, well, I guess, yeah, if I can add on to that, like, how do you like endure, <laughs> you know, how, and also how you care for yourselves as you do this kind of work. I'm going to do mine first because I really want to hear from Cecilia last because I think she, her answer is going to be better than mine. <laughs> um, I, 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 I ride my bike. <laughs> um, and you need, I think you need to deliberately, because if you're working with some stuff that's difficult, you, you need just to actively, deliberately do things that have nothing to do with that whatsoever. So like the book, I read before I go to bed has is as far away from anything that has to do with history or law as I can get. And it could just, I, I, I just need to, I, I need, I need to make, I need to be healthy. Uh -huh. Cecilia, you're up. <laughs> well, you know, I could, uh, reading the uh, transcripts of the um, war crimes, it, I can only take it in small doses because it is so horrific. It's so horrific. But then when you see what's happening in the world today, it's like, you got to do something, right? I mean, because it's happening again right before our very eyes. 
And that's why I think we need to persevere to make sure that these lessons of war are learned, uh, not just by, uh, in, in the case of World War II in the Philippines, not just by Filipinos, Filipino-Americans, but by everyone. Because it, it affects us in the present and it affects us in the future. So we have uh, a moral obligation, a sacred duty to ensure that these lessons will be learned by future generations because it's only in learning these uh, lessons of war can we have responsible leaders of tomorrow. Otherwise, it's the same thing over and over again, right? Yeah, I fully agree. So, so please, uh, Kara, uh, will you will you uh, about the? Uh, I'm just uh, looking one more time to see if there are there's some really interesting conversation happening in the chat, but I don't I think that's it for questions. Um, I posted the link to our feedback form earlier. I'm posting it again. Um, please, if you have a few minutes, take a few minutes to fill it out. We would love to hear from you about what you thought about the presentations today and also um, uh, future topics that you would like to, to see webinars about. Um, and I think that's pretty much it. Uh, in our last few minutes, do either of you have any closing remarks? Mark? I, I, Cecilia, I think you already said it. I think there's, there's value in documentation. I think there's value in making in telling the story. Uh, no matter what else happens, I, 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 that's, that's our primary, I think that's a primary obligation. Right. And as you said, if it cannot be won in the court of law, and, and you mentioned this, right? There is the court of history. And we need to keep that alive. Um, I want to thank uh, Professor Hall for uh, his participation today and in the past. And of course, Cara Zamora, she's a PhD candidate in medical anthropology. And she's been our wonderful uh, intern for how many years now, Cara? <laughs> <laughs> so many. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> but you know she's interested in history because of your grandfather right yeah and lots of other reasons but yeah that's R right yeah. yeah so so i would uh encourage all of you uh, especially those who have um, you know ancestors who were in the war to please document your ancestors uh, and teach them to the next generation because uh, we need to do this uh, so we can have a brighter future. <laughs> so, Kara, you want to okay. close the... Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and conclude the recording. Mm -hmm. And please go to our website, www.bataanlegacy.org, to look at the documents. And uh, we have two annual events, actually.